my first question for all you guys is, what was the one factor that you think made a difference for you that put you in the path to success? So we can start from you, Mr. Mayor. Well, I, don't, I don't know if it was one factor. It was a, a series of things that helped me become successful. Uh, obviously, my family, you know, my, my mother and father, the, the, the household that I grew up in. Uh, I had great friends, too. I grew up with great friends in my neighborhood, you know, on Avon and 14th, 11th Street. Had good friends who saw something in me, uh, you know, so they helped me get along that path. And, uh, you know, some of the stuff I can talk about publicly, some things is, you know, private discussion. But they, they, they helped me do the things that I needed to do without getting into trouble, right? Uh, and I had a, a, a love of reading and writing, you know, and when all else failed, I f always fell back on my ability to read and write, you know, write my own poetry, be creative, read and study, and those things helped me out tremendously. But I did see some of these questions earlier. And so I knew the first one was going to be like getting me to a point where emotionally um, would be tough. So my mom is my everything. She's just, oh my goodness. So she arrives in this country with my dad and my three older sisters not speaking English, of course. And um, you know she raised my three older sisters and me after I was born and, and after uh, their divorce on welfare and uh, you know when I started doing all of the work necessary for the application process for this position. You know, we knew certain things, but the whole idea that she was doing all of this with a three hundred fifty dollar welfare check um, from since I was a year and a half until I turned eighteen um, just you know speaks volumes about you know who she is, why she exists, and. Uh, very important. You know, the idea that education is the way out was one of the things. Even though we're still living in the same apartment since I was eight years old, um, the idea that it was about worrying about myself, but that that wasn't enough. Like, she didn't raise me or teach us to just be good people. She did that. but. It was this sense of worrying about everybody else and making sure that everybody else was okay. And uh, I'm grateful to her for that. Is this on? Okay, great. Good morning, everyone. Um, so the superintendent is gonna make me switch my answer and get all sentimental. <laughs> um, but I think we take that for, for granted, right? So I, I think, Yes, I had my mother, she was amazing, she still is, really strong, provided the foundation, but it was this. So I actually don't wanna just kinda gloss over that because not everybody has that. Um, and even in the need to be adaptable and in the struggles of growing up in a single mother household on public assistance, um, there was a certain level of stability that we still found, right? And so I think I am where I am and I have the level of confidence that I have because I learned very early on ways to find stability within the unstableness of it all. And a lot of that came from my mother. We appreciate all three of you for giving those answers and thank you for trusting us with your emotions at this moment in time. Uh, so to also jump right in, Superintendent Leon, I do have a question for you about how does how do you feel trauma impacts chronic absenteeism, school safety, and high school graduation? Absolutely. I mean, it impacts um, in every aspect mm -hmm. um, of our students. I think that one of the important things, uh, in particular, the incredible work, the incredible work that ACNJ. Um, has done, as well as all of the research, you know, and, and inquiries that I did starting um, in July 1 when I assumed this role, is that um, we're good at saying there's a problem. Um, sometimes we don't acknowledge it. 
uh, but we seldom do anything about it. So the whole idea that mental health issues are real, um, we know that um, we have adults that have mental health problems and that if we don't do something intentional about it in, in the schools, that what we'll do for our mayor is just, and all of the citizens, is just continue to produce adults who actually have mental health problems. So really attacking it, um, it makes uh, important decisions for, for our students uh, to determine not to come to school, to determine to come to school and not to be as effective as they can be, that it, it doesn't provide excuses, but true, in fact, impediments for, uh, for them to be actually successful. And so the second part to this. Yes. I want to I wanna say something directly to that, if, if it's okay. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like I know the DEA has a program now with us, and I always like to mention that because it's a great program, uh, that where they have to call the school and let them know when uh, you know, some trauma has happened to a child over the weekend or after school and report that to school. That's important you know, because when I was a principal, for example, the they there was a raid on uh, you know Academy Spires. You know you know we we probably know Academy Spires, but we gotta take y'all over there, Academy Spires, and um, you know they arrested maybe like 20, 30 people, right? So these are people's parents, and so what what they what they what you don't understand is that those kids have to go to school, so some of those kids probably went to school and came to school not knowing where they was gonna go when they left the school or what was happening to them. Or well, some of them probably didn't even make it to school, right? They probably felt like I didn't wanna be bothered with what's going on and I don't, you know, I don't, you know, I just experienced some serious trauma in my house. So that's, uh, it's, it's difficult. And there's a, we could, that subject alone is a whole panel, uh, hours of discussion of how do you, re how do you deal with that and what do we need to do uh, in, in our schools, in our city, to make sure kids and young people are not victimized or by incidents that happen that they had absolutely nothing to do with. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Mayor Ross, I really thank you for that, because that's a great segue into the second part of the question to Superintendent Leon. How are we working with teachers to deal with trauma in school? Well, you know, one of the interesting things that um, that I did on this, figuring out what is it that we currently do. Um, so what we currently do is we have a videotape that our school counselors or social workers are supposed to sit at their computer, watch. It'll take about a half hour, and they get an indicator that they are now an expert in this topic. And then they may or may not have meetings with teachers. Now, you know, we've been here our whole entire lives, right? I didn't even know that this was a reality. And so um, they may or may not then turn key that training to our staff. So how successful is that? Well, let's conclude that it isn't. So one of the first things that we did is actually partner with Rutgers and begin to do actual training for those first people who will be the ones that teachers actually turn to. So we've actually conducted a, a series of trainings. We already finished the second full day of it. That's an entire school day twice where we've actually taken the, the folks that uh, will either directly work with our students to eventually address um, these particular issues. That's the phase where we're in right now. You know, sometimes a student doesn't go to that school counselor. There is a teacher in that school. And then teacher, in my book, is defined differently. So teacher, by most definition, would be someone who's certified ha that actually has a certificate that says they are allowed to teach a particular subject to students. That's not how I see teacher uh, in terms of this topic. Kids go to counts, um, uh, custodial workers, they go to security guards, they go to that secretary that's always on them. So it's about training everyone in the organization. Um, I met with the great folks at the um, uh, Street Academy and we were talking about the work that they're doing. So 
we have people in the city that are doing work. Well, what we want to do is make sure that in partnerships, whatever trainings we're doing in the schools, things that we know are going to work, that we begin to provide assistance and support to anyone else who's out there doing work that isn't directly related to our, um, to our staff. So um, part of what we're doing now is intensifying the support for the leads and then actually making sure that everyone gets direct training as it relates to that. But it's just not teacher in the classroom, it's teacher in the classroom and then everyone who's a support at the school. All right, thank you for that. Uh, I do understand the value of having like a teacher that you can confine in to be able to have a relationship with. Uh, when I was in school, like I try to have a relationship with everyone because you, you're in school for every day for four years in high school. So it's important to establish some kind of like mutual understanding, uh, especially like the other uh, employees such as janitors and cafeteria workers. Uh, but it's also important to keep in mind that, you know, the impact of drama does not just ha happen to students and students at school. Other pressures that happen to young people are the feeling of how am I going to be able to support myself? So, Ms. Alicia Glover, Aisha, sorry. What is innovative about Newark's approach, approach to growing jobs and economic activities to benefit young men in the long term? So thank you for that question. And I think um, first and foremost, I, I push back a little bit with Kathim and then very quickly with Ryan um, because I'm usually on economic development panels and talking about jobs and growth and opportunities in the city. And I was like, Kathim, I don't know. This is like a little outside my wheelhouse. He's like, no, it's not. And he reminded me specifically of other things I've said on other panels. Um, and, and, and Ryan corrected me this morning and I think the innovation comes with the level of understanding of we cannot continue to work in silos. This is one city, we're all pushing towards the same goal and it's not a, okay, education is over here, youth is over here, health is over here, economic development is over here. And even though I like to believe that I lead with that and I, I think that way and keep that very much front of mind in the, in the work, I still compartmentalize it, right? So thank you <laughs> for that reminder. Um, and I say that to say there are very specific programs that are underway and efforts that are underway to drive economic development and drive economic activity and investment to the city. There's over $4.7 billion of development underway. The mayor launched a charge to hire 2020 residents by the year 2020. Um, we have very specific workforce training and development programs. Um, but when I look at our portal of 600 plus people that are trying to access jobs, over a third are youth. And so we have to be, and we have started to be very intentional about our partnerships. I see NCLC in the audience, NCI, Brave and Opportunity Youth. Um, we have started to think very purposefully about the types of partnerships and relationships that we have so that way we're feeding our talent pool with youth from around the city to make sure that we're then finding them opportunities within all these large corporations and anchor institutions around the city. Um, one other trend that we've started to see is that folks are hiring, the corporations and anchor institutions are hiring at a higher rate youth than they are adults. And it's a, a tremendous opportunity for us to say, how do we continue to push that? And they're starting with internships mostly and the interns to hire and that's the easiest way for them to kind of onboard and there are some corporations that start kind of at uh, freshman year of high school and then trying to work with youth, youth to really think about how they're developing their pipeline. Um, so one of the reasons why I chose to move over to the Alliance is to really harness the power and the potential on the corporate and anchor side. We're all in this city, we all feel like it's kind of corporations and anchors over there and then everybody else over here, right? And so really trying to work to, to bridge that so that way they see the value of the talent that's right here and that we can really think a lot more holistically about how we're growing economically and how we're investing in the city and that clearly includes investing in its people. You know, one of the interesting things, if I may, yeah. that 
um, we've allowed in the school system and the philosophy that had existed here um, that worked for us. Because if this group is doing this issue here and that group is doing that issue there and the others are doing that, that, you know, the movement at the schools, you know, how it impacts the whole thing, we were good and happy, I would argue, with things being dissected. And so part of what I am doing, because I disagree with all of that, is creating a new ecosystem in our school district that speaks to working actually collaboratively together. The hard part is that there are too many good people who've been trying to do their parts. So sometimes the pieces are actually bigger than the whole, where somebody thinks that my part is so important that the fact that you wanna try and fix the whole thing is not important because my part is what's most important. So the little piece is bigger than trying to fix the whole thing, where in fact what I'm doing is saying there's a big piece and that your part is critical towards its success, but your piece over here isn't where I need it. I need it here. So ultimately, the whole idea about where the economic aspect of this work, you know, the mayor and I just finished leaving uh, with Senator Ruiz, and she talks about education as an economic issue, that we know if we do a better job in schools and provide opportunities while you are in school, that that's actually gonna change the actual uh, status of whatever our community eventually um, is poised to become. All right, excellent. Thank you guys for that again, especially Ms. Glover. Thank you for coming out of your wheelbarrow and still showcasing your knowledge. Uh, Mayor Ross, I'm in your... <laughs> Mayor Ross, I'm, I'm around you very frequently, so to speak. I, I always enjoy the fact I get to hear you speak, uh, especially speak your mind, especially in the men's meetings, where you give us as much knowledge as you can in such a short amount of time of the men's meetings. So while I may know your answer to this question, I'm still gonna ask it so the audience can know the answer to this question. Uh, why is it important that the city of Newark addresses trauma and becomes trauma informed? And if you don't know what trauma informed is, it is being aware of the after effects of trauma. Why is it that the Newark address trauma, be trauma informed, and what is being done to help young people? So uh, thank you for that. I mean. One, we, we have to be very, first we got to be very intentional and deliberate about what we're doing and what we're saying. Uh, I got a lot of pushback, well not a lot, let me change that. Got a little pushback, a couple of whispers about my focus at the state of the city on black and brown boys, mostly. Uh, and I did that very deliberately, uh, you know, because in order to fix what's happening, you have to actually address what these issues are. I think we've been afraid to say what's actually happening, uh, not in just in Newark, but around the country, uh, you know, to circumvent the success of a particular group of people in this country for hundreds of years, right? And so at some point, we have to fix it, right? And, and, and uh, you know, I just called a, uh, a meeting with all of the organizations in the city that uh, do alternative uh, police strategies to reduce crime and violence that deal with trauma, uh, you know, from Opportunity Youth Network to Newark Anti-Violence Coalition to Newark Street Academy, everybody together, so we can have uh, a kind of uh, MOU, if you will, a collective to deal with these problems head on and straight ahead. And I, 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 I started by telling them, introducing them to my trauma, because I live, I'm, I'm, I have learned and grown. Uh, to live with trauma that I have experienced being a black man in Newark, right? And so uh, I, the, the trauma that I have undergone and started that off, you know, somebody after the meeting was like, you know, wow, you know, but I said that everybody could go around and say similar things, right? And, and you know, fr from me witnessing people uh, killed, from me being stopped by the police, me, and be, me almost being strip searched, and then the political aspect of, of it, because my mother and father, watching my father be beat by the police, pulled out of the car, all the kind of things that's, that has happened it, to my life, to me, uh, and, and you know, you grow up with this trauma, and you do not identify it, you do not address it, so our young people grow up with the same level of trauma, and it needs to be addressed. We can't expect people to advance and succeed at the expectations that 
uh, that they're dealing with in their lives. And some people have grown accustomed to dealing with trauma. In fact, we've taken the trauma and, and have romanticized it, flipped it on his head, and made it feel like because we went, to this, went through this trauma that it somehow made us stronger and not understanding that the trauma we went through made us weaker. Uh, that is actually a sickness and a disease that we have to address. So we took the sickness and we took the disease just like we took uh, you know, pig guts and made it chitlins, you know what I mean? So we took it and, and, and we flipped it on his head and turned it into something romantic when really it's death, right? It's killing us. Uh, and so we have to address it straight ahead in all of our institutions, school, uh, uh, you know, hospitals, whatever institution you have, you have to address this trauma or else we'll never uh, witness the success uh, that we need to witness uh, in these communities. Um, you know, you got young boys walking around here thinking because they've experienced this kind of trauma that it, somehow it makes them hard, right? But it really makes you weak, right? It's, right. it's, it's weak and, 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 and stop your ability to grow. So that's why we need to address it, you know? And the city is trying to do a myriad of different things uh, to address trauma uh, collectively by creating alternative systems that speak to trauma right at, right, right in his face and not try to color it as something else or pretend it doesn't exist. And so we, we do that, right, right, right on. Thank you, Mayor Baraka. Can I just quickly uh, add to that? Um, and I just want to commend the mayor on his State of the City address because, you know, you've kind of seen the evolution over the years. And I think we've reached this point and this moment in our city where we have to call things out, right? And so we can't keep dressing it for show and saying, this is where we are, this is where we're heading, we have to kind of call out what is not always comfortable to call out, and it was important that, we, that he did that in a space that doesn't, didn't look like this, right? So that it, there was strong representation of corporations in the room, developers, investors, people that w probably would not have otherwise had that conversation one-on-one -on -one with the mayor, where I literally had people coming to me after and saying, I'm wondering how we could fit in now. And that's, that's the exact point that we should be at. We should be thinking about our programs, our initiatives, our efforts, and how we are directly addressing the realities that exist. Not the perception that we, you know, you, 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 know, you clean up, before you have company, right? You want your house to look a certain way <laughs> and tidy. But the reality is that you have to face that reality and you have to bring people in in a way that is bold and unapologetic and intentional and forces people to figure out how they fit in to that goal, right? And not vice versa. Thank you, Mayor Ross and Ms. Glover for that. I'm sorry, Superintendent Go Leon. Ahead. We do got some more questions we All really right, want to ask you guys. Well, I love that uh, we're talking about trauma and how it needs to be addressed. So my question is uh, for Mr. Superintendent. Uh, it's about school discipline. How can we adjust discipline, disciplinary policies to reflect restorative justice practices? Perfect. So for example, uh, if a student were to walk in without a uniform, sometimes that can lead to in-school suspension, well, resulting in the student being separated from the class environment and you know, therefore, not learning. So, how can we uh, how can we uh, make policies to be more inclusive? My question would come back to me, right? So I'm always ready. Um, so one of the things, so I'm, I'm going to get to the to the answer uh, to that question. Part of uh, the attendance policy that we have in this district right now creates an attendance problem. Because the first sentence of it says, um, you know, you could be out 100, uh, sorry, 10 days of school, you only need to be in school for 170 days. So automatically, if you read that and you're a student, be like, bet, I can be out 10 days, I'm good. Right? When we know the report out of Chicago says that once you hit that 10% that absence, you're, that's one of the three critical criteria for dropping out of high school as early as grade three. So we have third graders who, if they actually read that and saw, oh, I can be out, or their parents, 
I could actually be out of school that many times, they're not aware, nor does the policy say, yeah, if you do that, you're actually um, in risk of dropping out. As it relates to the discipline policy, the same thing holds true. Um, the, the discipline policy doesn't say, oh, if you commit an offense, you have to be suspended from school. Like, for example, oh, we know for a fact, and this occurred years ago, I'm not saying that's not occurring today, but I know it did occur years ago, where students were late to school. They were like, oh, you're late. Uh, you can't come in. Um, the whole idea that you're not wearing your uniform. Well, we actually want students wearing their uniforms, right? So ultimately, uh, we actually want students in school. Oh, actually, we want students in class. Actually, we want students with an awesome teacher that is actually going to help them learn. That's really what we want. So once we get kids in school, the, the task of educating them is the most difficult thing. The work that teachers do is really, really hard. But ultimately, the policies that we have, and in particular the discipline policy, would enable us to allow a kid now to be out from school. So you could you're out from school because you have a problem, you're out from school because you are sick, well you could actually be out from school because of school. That's the problem. So the discipline policy, there are a lot of people that worked on creating, the discipline policy is new. We changed it about what, two, uh, a year and a half, two years ago. And there are a lot of great people that worked on creating the new policy with all of these restorative practices that still allow a principal to suspend you for whatever reason that they want to, that doesn't actually get to the point of creating an opportunity to uh, address the actual issues and become successful. How do you fix the uniform? Well, at, at University High School, when I was principal there, uh, there wasn't a uniform uh, policy in the district, but I required everyone to wear gray from the bottom, from the waist down, and maroon from the waist up. And I had a lot of clothes in the closet in my office that was there with a lot of dust that you could wear if you forgot to do that. And so what happened is most students didn't want to wear that. I used to weigh 350 pounds, so it would be really, really baggy clothes on most of our students. Students. I'm not 350 no more, but the whole idea that there were, you have options. In life, you have options. And at that school, the option was to do what I say. Now, you could do what you want, then you go to the closet and get some big clothes. What's important, see how many eyes are in here? Whenever an infraction occurs, we need people to actually say that something is wrong. I just wanted to do this, and I know you're gonna be mad, and I just met you, and I love you, but um, at the start of the year, I met with all of the students, grades eight through 12, at 2,500 intervals. I met with all eighth graders. I have a script of, that I wrote myself, and I know all of the questions that I'm asking. I usually I know the answer to the question I'm asking. But this time I decided to ask eighth graders a question and I wasn't ready for the answer to the mayor's prior point about trauma. Imagine 2,500 students in the room and I was really far away from them because of where the PowerPoint was located. And I asked them, how many of you have a family member, not somebody who's your brother, he's my brother, not somebody who's your brother, but somebody that is a blood relative, not even like a foster person, not even a stepbrother, your actual blood and you lost them to violence. And 2,000 students' hands went up. So they couldn't see me, but my staff members who were next to me prepping me knew that I, that wasn't one of the questions I was supposed to ask. It wasn't a question that I was ready for the answer. And I began to cry. Now they couldn't see me, and they don't even know this, but when I meet with them as ninth graders, I'm gonna tell them that what I did on the side was cry. Because one of the biggest problems about trauma is the numbing effect of it. So I was assessing, Oh my goodness, it's unfair that you are 13 years old and your brother is dead because somebody decided to kill them. That, and then how are we non-responsive to that? A teacher in a classroom who's supposed to provide the services that are important has tally marks. And I walk behind her and I said, what is that? It said 48. And I said, what did that mean? She said, that's the 48th child that has died. A teacher should not be doing those tally marks. She wasn't even talking about the child anymore. She was just waiting for the next tally mark. That's powerful. Um, that's actually a perfect uh, follow-up to my uh, next question pertaining to teachers and the, relation, the relationship between teachers and students. So what is being done to train the teachers in the workforce so that they can be better connected and relate to the students? 
Um, I, I'm, I was tough on my students, and I'm definitely tough on my teachers, and now in this role, tough on my principals. So we probably get a good F minus in this area. So the whole idea that um, we have staff development days, uh, that's an opportunity for us to have students not with our staff members, and then to really intensify assistance and support. So we need to do things intentional that we know are gonna help us get out of the hole as it relates to like literacy instruction, math instruction, and all of the important content in the areas. We avoid teaching the arts and providing PD with regards to the arts, so making sure that there are opportunities that are afforded with them. Uh, part of what we will actually change is that there has to be dedication to time. So part of what happened to me has to happen to people. We, some people don't know, don't know. Um, as a principal, I required all of my new teachers to visit the houses of their, chi of their students by the uh, October 30th. Why October 30th, I don't know, but it was to avoid this. I walk in, it walked into a classroom and a teacher was disciplining a student in particular and, and saying, you know, your mother has to come in because you're really, really disrespectful. And the kid just didn't respond. And she says, and I'm going to call her this afternoon. And I walked up to the teacher and whispered in his ear, you know, are you aware uh, that um, the child's mother is actually dead? She died a couple years ago. So that resulted in teachers having to go to the house. And I only made new teachers do that. Now, the whole idea about making people do things, I'm actually kind of good at. But the ultimate point is that if you don't know your students, I'm looking at him right now, I have no idea who he is, okay? But he has a story, and he has a life. And if I'm going to educate him, I have to learn all of that. So we have to train our teaching staff in particular to know the importance of doing that and then to actually go do it. Superintendent Leon, please keep your microphone on. Next question is towards you. <laughs> So, uh, as an artist, uh, I felt very, I felt misrepresented in my first high school. Uh, I was actually banned from doodling in class because my principal felt like it was a distraction for me, when in reality, that's what I used to focus. Um, and a lot of my teachers, specifically my civics teacher, she looked at me come into class and said, if you don't doodle, you have to get out, which her taking that stand has definitely helped me in the long run. Uh, so, I'm going to ask you. How are we preparing students to be ready to take on STEM and creative opportunities? And what are we doing to change the curriculum to affect that? Yeah, so that's an extremely important aspect of it. The answer is a whole lot longer than what I will give you, but actually having teachers rewrite curriculum is one aspect of it. Our teachers are, are being told what to do, and they're not really a, playing a critical role in that. Um, yesterday, I announced at our, our budget hearing that you know we have an Amistad, uh, uh, an Amistad bill that kind of dictates what we actually should do, and then we f do a good job of failing to do that. So a part of really creating a civics curriculum in our schools so that students actually take it when the mayor was a student at University High School and I was a student at Science uh, High School, there were opportunities that we actually had then that don't exist today for whatever the reasons are. So bringing some aspects of really important learnings that occurred in the past uh, is critical. Internship opportunities. Audible is doing an awesome job at modeling what that actually is supposed to look like. They started it with North Star. Uh, two years ago, they asked me, you know, of the high schools, which was the high school. So we actually created a partnership at Science High School as it relates to that. There are up ticks that are going to occur in all of our comprehensive high schools. So the academy opportunities will provide true choice for people. So if you want to go to the school across town, it's going to be a school that's going to provide you with a unique um, opportunity. You know, um, it, each uh, high school will have a different focus. So the way we see our comprehensive high schools today is something that we're actually um, kind of jump starting. So internships, mentoring becomes extremely important. You know, um, there are uh, people who have reached out to me as as early as a little while ago, and definitely in the months leading to the, even this conversation about the importance of their roles in helping in the work. So there are big announcements. We, the mayor and I did a big announcement at Eastside High School with regards to Montclair State University and the American Federation of Teachers. We're going to be doing those major announcements with partners between higher education and a um, business organization to help us move the conversation. Westside is the next announcement. Rutgers School of Business since it's a block away and Google. It'll transform what our schools look like Absolutely. so that our students see them as not only the building that everyone is walking to, but one that they're going to be able to walk out from leading the way. We definitely thank you for that, Superintendent Leon, and definitely thank you for giving us the information. Uh, Mayor Ross, you are a big art man. You take art 
as seriously as you take your own life. How is Newark positioning itself to help arts and tech sectors flourish? And how are young men of color a part of that growth? So, you know, Newark just got rated recently as one of the top 10 most thriving communities for artists Absolutely. in the nation. So uh, this, you know, our, yeah, that deserves a clap, right? So yeah, that, uh, and that's, and that actually really has really nothing to do with me, except that we create spaces and opportunity for artists to actually feel like they are a part of the social and economic fabric of the city, that the city can't grow unless there's a significant number of artists in it. And we take the posture that communities can be redeveloped or changed when artists come in them. Right, we you know so you probably do better with a hundred thousand more artists than a hundred thousand more police, right? So you you infuse those people in the community, they begin to transform what that community is, what it looks like. That's why we put that stage on Clinton Avenue. Absolutely, we did the art around the, the on the on the ground there, and everything else will be messed up, but won't nobody mess with that part, right? So we we want we want to continue to do things like that and make artists feel artist co-ops. Artists, uh, you know, housing, you know, uh, create opportunities for young artists and incubate them uh, in the city. And the, the tech community is also growing because of uh, businesses like Audible that, that that sit here because of the fiber uh, that exists here in our city, because of the venture capital fund that you know incubates new artists, NJIT, NJII, the the incubator they have at NJIT, all of the things that are happening uh, towards tech helps the city to grow in that area. And we are focusing heavy on trying to get uh, more of our young people involved in coding, uh, summer coding camps, coding, ca coding at NJIT, after school coding opportunities. Uh, you know, we have Women Who Code, you know, Newark Code, all these organizations that we're trying to target very specifically uh, people of our community so they can get involved uh, in these things. Um, in a general sense, uh, what we have a tendency to do is look at everything that's wrong, right? We look at everything, because we, we play defense very well. We look at everything that's wrong and we build off, we say what's wrong and then we stop there, right? So what we should do is begin looking at the things that have been successful and figure out do they have a relationship to the people in the community who have not witnessed that success, Right? Then figure out why aren't they in those spaces. Right? So some people are successful. Some people are involved in all of these things. How come these people aren't? Like, how come this subgroup of folks are not involved uh, or a part of the success that everybody else is experiencing and begin to, to you know, uh, figure out how to do that? You go backwards from that, backward map from that, that final phase. And that's what we're trying to do around all of the things that are happening in the city. All right. Uh, we all heard of the starving artists. Uh, you can work hard to flourish your artwork, but you may not be able to make the money to see a nice life. So my question is for Ms. Glover. Um, is there any strategies in mind uh, currently to help cultivate young men and their arts and to be able to uh, be financially stable in the process? Sure, so um, when I was overseeing the Newark Community Economic Development Corporation, we launched programs specifically so that artists could be treated as entrepreneurs. So oftentimes, and I can say this because my husband is a music producer, they're so creative and they're off on their own and not really thinking about how this can be a successful kind of revenue generating business. Um, and so we launched a series of programs for artists, uh, some that were in partnership with uh, women in media to address specifically and provide skills around business management, about cash flow management, marketing, your business development practices. So that way you begin to see yourself as an entrepreneur, not only an artist. Um, so that was one very kind of clear initiative that was and still continues to be underway. Um, another thing that we're currently looking at is, um, as you know, there's this kind of boom going on in the city 
Um, but then there's still empty retail space, right? You still walk around and still see plenty of vacancy even downtown. Um, and so working very closely with uh, property owners and developers um, to open up those spaces as pop-up shops, as pop-up galleries and locations. So one, Newark Arts Council is working very closely on right now on uh, Raymond Boulevard on Raymond and Broad. Um, we've looked at other locations on Park Place. So this is kind of, again, the bridging of both worlds, right? We know that there's this economic development and activity going on, but then we know there's also this need to create space, to create safe spaces, affordable space, and access for people that would not otherwise gain access. And so, again, just trying to be very deliberate about how we're bridging those two worlds. Some of that is specifically around programs, and some of it is an opportunity opportunities related to real estate. Thank you for that. And we do have a few more questions and a few more answers, hopefully. Uh, we'll try to get through this as fast as we can because we want to make sure all of people's questions are answered. So Ms. Glover, back to you again. Uh, how are you working with companies to connect young people to jobs in those areas, especially like those creative ideas and creative areas? Uh, so a few ways. One uh, specifically is around workforce development. So anyone can go onto the newark2020.com platform to register and enroll and kind of get in the pipeline so that way we can begin to make some of those matches. We also uh, provide direct training programs. Um, for example, we partner with PSENG, we partner with uh, New Community Corporation, uh, Perscolis, which is about to open in um, on, on Broad Street for tech training. They're actually specifically targeting um, disconnected youth, so between <clears throat> the ages of 18 and we have <laughs> no me, age 18 gap. yep 18 and 24 or 25 ish um uh and and their focus around cybersecurity when you graduate from that program what they've done what they've done very um in a very savvy way is to establish the relationships with the corporations on the front end so that way you're not just training for the sake of training but you're training towards a placement and so we've helped facilitate a lot of those introductions as well and they have uh, already um, uh, both job orders and training programs that are about to launch so um, those are just a, a couple of quick examples all right uh, back to Mr. Su Superintendent. Uh, question we have is: What are you doing to be more? What are we doing to be more representative of classrooms, more people of color, and more people to relate to students? Well, I mean, one of the things that you will see on um, McCarter Highway uh, soon will be a posting of um, just job opportunities in Newark on the leadership front, as well as on the um, actual teaching front. So um, we're going to have vacancies, and we need um, the very, very best to be applying. We have a lot of good teachers right now in our city. We actually have a lot of really good principals. I don't need any more of those. I actually need great people to assume these jobs. So the, the fact that uh, I don't really care what the person actually looks like, if they are the the greatest possible employee, I want them. I know for a fact that I have students that have graduated from the school where I was principal that have not had the opportunity, and one of them in particular, a black male, um, graduated from college, uh, was an incredible basketball player, um, has a degree in mathematics, uh, has a degree in a certificate in special education, applied to Newark about three years ago, and uh, did not get the job because obviously we don't need a black male math, uh, special ed certified um, graduate from uh, college, right? So the whole idea that I'm assuming this role doesn't mean that everything will be perfect once, but everything will get perfect at a certain point in time. So the whole idea that we need to just make sure that all of the opportunities people are aware of and seeking Newark as an option to work. We will make sure that the, pri the, that the actual employment contracts that we provide folks are uh, one that will actually uh, result in uh, great people coming uh, to our city. So uh, quickly, uh, we have questions from uh, the audience. Uh, you can go through it quick, quickly. Uh, one of the questions is, how can we improve the crime rate in Newark? 
Mayor? Well, every year the crime rate has been improving. So thank God for that. I mean, we have had historic lows in the city for the last two years. I mean, 50 year low in homicides, you know, uh, all of the the shootings are down, carjacking down 85%, right? Doesn't mean that we are we don't have any problems. You know, crime is intractable uh, in the city as long as you have poverty and all these other issues, these social determinants, you're gonna have crime and violence in the city. Uh, what we have been able to do is find ways to decrease it by focusing in on, in, or, on areas that are high in violence and crime. Uh, so w there's a lot more work to be done in that area, it's always gonna be uh, more work to be done in that area, but uh, we have been experiencing some success in the last couple of years. Uh, another question from the audience, a young person gives you their story of when they were going to school and their cousin uh, murdered in the middle of the street, and this young person had to view this and hold their cousin as such a thing happened. And the, cousin, and the young person would like to know, how can kids feel safe going to school and coming from school? Well, that's why we established the Newark Community Street Team, and we have Safe Passage Way to School. What we need to do is get some more money to fund it so they can expand it across the city and have it at every school, as opposed to two or three schools, right? So we have Safe Passage Way. Some schools experience it, some schools are not, because we have not funded it at that level. And so that's why we are pulling together the law enforcement agencies next week. We met with the providers the week before, uh, so we're, we're gonna meet with the law enforcement agencies to begin to divert funding from those organizations and begin to use them on alternative strategies like that, right? So if you take all of the police agencies in this area, you're talking about a couple hundred million dollars that could be used to begin to create opportunities to do alternative policing and violence reduction strategies uh, that are community-based. And that, that's what we want to do, and I think it's more effective uh, in some aspects. All right. Another question we have is um, for the superintendent. How can we improve the school system to make people want to go to school? That's the All biggest right. question there is. All right, when we get that answer, we're going to be good. <laughs> but obviously, that's what has to happen. We yeah. have to, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, students do not come to school because they're going to get an education, uh, become successful, and then get a job and raise a family. And hopefully, I know the mayor and I always talk about this, but we definitely want them to obviously do all of that and then stay in Newark, right? That's not the majority of our students. That is what our goal is. But kids want to come to school because their friends are there. So what do we do? Provide opportunities where they're not with their friends. So the whole idea of making sure that we have tapped into what the wants are becomes important. You do that by conducting needs assessments with your students, actually asking them, what are the type of classes you actually want here? There's a process, we have a board member here, there's a process that will allow us to do certain things. When the mayor was principal at Central High School, he thought of some incredible classes that no one was doing in the city of Newark. All that he did, he created with his brilliance, the, the course, I walked it through the district's policy process. It got approved, and there were students that were actually taking classes after school. Students at Central High School were staying after school, not because they couldn't do math, but they because they wanted to excel in the advanced placement courses and the incredible opportunities he was providing them. 32%, 29% in literacy and math scores rose at that school because of his leadership. But it was because he knew that what they wanted is what was going to make them come to school. It's not, yeah, fixing schools is not easy. And obviously addressing and changing an entire school system is the biggest challenge of my life. And I get it. But I know that if I actually have them helping me figure it out, that's how we're going to do it. So making sure that we have a good pulse on what our students are believing and needing, and then actually giving it to them. Thank you for that, Superintendent Leon. I would like to ask for a time check so we can see how many more questions we've got. One more, got you. So this question I've been kind of dying to ask, so to speak. Uh, as the city grows, how can we make sure that young men from all wards are active participants? And when we say active participants, we don't mean getting them jobs. We mean helping them learn how to be entrepreneurs, helping them teach the young people behind them how to be entrepreneurs, and how to make sure those young people keep that cycle in the system. So first I would say, 
bring them to the men's meeting. But That's uh, a fact. I, I, I sat in a meeting yesterday, three uh, African-American young guys in a meeting uh, who are developing, getting ready to develop three projects, one across the street from Weekway High School, one up the street on Lyons Avenue, the other one on Orange Street, right? These three gentlemen met each other at the men's meeting. They, they met each other, they formed an, a corporation, uh, they partnered with a large developer, they came to the city, talked to us about their projects, they gave us their performer, and now they're getting ready to develop these projects, right? So uh, our job is, is not to see things as they are, but see them as they should be, right? And then you have to have the idea that everything that happens in the city happens because of you, uh, not in spite of you. And then you take and so this what the, that's what those young guys did. They found that opportunity, attached themselves to somebody, and began identifying properties that they know exist because they live in those communities that developers don't know exist because they all hanging around downtown trying to find big properties. They said, look, I live in this neighborhood. This property is empty. It's been empty for 15 years. I'm going to build something on it, particularly since now I have an ability to do that with a new ordinance that gives me the opportunity to be a minority co-developer. I'm going to find somebody who has the capital to help me invest in this project and tell them you can't do this project unless I'm at the table, right? And then come downtown with the mayor and say, listen, we want to do this project and we brought this guy here to help us. Not he want to do the project and he brought us here to help us. We want to do the project and he's here to help us get this done. And, and those, those programs exist. We have to begin to be forward thinking and take advantage of that stuff. You know, we have to impose on our students thinking and we have to help them see something that they perhaps don't realize or disrupt their abnormal. And you know, magical things happen in threes. So you have the three doctors from University High School. What did they do? They created a pact. And then they actually wrote the book, The Pact. At one point in time in this city, we required all ninth graders when they were actually arriving into high school to, be, to that be their required reading material during the course of the summer so they could actually see that they actually have the potential and sometimes the school system is the barrier. Part of the work is to flip that on its head, let them see how beautiful they can actually be and then help them accomplish that. So I just wanna quickly add to, to what the mayor is saying because it's worth kind of just doubling down. There's, there's two kind of sides to that coin, right? The city advanced legislation and set up the programs and has begun to really establish a system to support minority developers. But the other side is that of that is the individuals taking responsibility and being proactive, going to the men's meeting, coming back to the mayor, forming, uh, forming their entity, going about it the right way, right? So, to his earlier point of kind of not being spectators or complaining, for lack of a better term, we have to be really active in how we want to shape the city because it's developing with or without us, right? And so no matter how many systems the mayor, uh, the, the, the city puts in place, to make sure that we are um, uh, kind of building a safety net people actually, you have to take advantage of that, right? And you have to go about it the right way. So I think it's just important to kind of double down and say that there are a lot of resources, and so that's why forums like this are really critical in kind of getting the word out. There are a lot of resources, but they have to be uh, identified and they have to be taken advantage of. Yeah. Okay, final question. Is there an issue that you would like to work on that you haven't had the time to address? Uh, we could start with you, Mr. Mayor. Well, uh, one of the issues we're beginning to address it now is this universal basic income uh, that uh, we haven't been able to address. That I, you know, we I just raised it at the last state of the city uh, with the help of you know Aisha Glover when she was at NCDC and still helping us now, and uh, Kevin, who's out here somewhere. Uh, you know, who's a uh, working point on uh, getting us around this universal basic income, I believe is, is, is something that we need. And that's, that's basically making sure, you know, that people have basic sustenance. I mean, we've, we're, we're able to put a person on the moon, we're just not able to make sure everybody eats. Uh, it's just, it does, we can, you know, talk to people all over the world without leaving our seat. We just can't make sure people are able to pay their rent. 
right? And so we have to figure out a way to, to make those things happen. So we want to run a pilot, a test here in the city of Newark, and we're going to spend a lot of time working on that uh, to begin to create this concept and idea around universal basic income. And that's something that we're going to work on uh, very strong this, uh, this year and the next. No issues. No, I'm kidding. Um, so uh, we finished uh, submitting a, a budget. Um, there are some serious uh, implications uh, to it. So, uh, you know, making sure that the goals that we have for the district, um, based on the needs that we're uh, analyzing, that that's just an ongoing process and uh, um, making sure that uh, when we create timelines with this strategic plan that is going to be launched in June, that it is going to set a different mindset about what schooling is supposed to be like for people in Newark. And uh, it's going to lead to what is uh, a 10 year strategic plan. We're good at saying, here's the problem and here's the answer, but we are going to model how great we can be when we think about a whole entire 10, a decade, and be able to say we can plan for it and accomplish the goals that uh, we have for it. And in the process, just managing expectations, uh, just on a personal level, that's one of the issues that I am, um, you know, constantly being reminded that everyone has a very important issue, but everyone's important issue is not necessarily going to be resolved today. So I think I could say this because I'm only a few months into my new job, uh, which is um, I think helping to close that gap between the corporate and anchor community and the residential community so it doesn't feel so disconnected and there's some real dollars behind it, there's some real investment. We can give you a bunch of examples of kind of model corporations or anchor institutions that have good programs, but it's quite honestly, just very fragmented. How do we really leverage that in a way that we all feel like we're in and of Newark? And this is not, to your point, just a job, but it feels like we're growing together. So I, I go to sleep thinking about that every day. I wake up thinking about it every day. What are some specific programs, specific initiatives? Sometimes that's just a feeling and getting buy-in from someone new that's like, oh, okay, I get it. Um, but really trying to address that and close that gap in a way that we all feel like the city is growing together. Well, thank you, thank you guys. Uh, I want to I want to thank you guys personally for taking the time to come here and giving us insightful information and uh, critiques. Do uh, you have anything, anything more? Uh, again, I want to thank you guys for coming out. Uh, thank you guys for trusting us with some of your more particular parts of your stories, of your past, and the things that have helped you get to where you are today. And I also want to thank everyone in the audience for being a part of us, as well as paying attention to these powerful people that are sitting right in front of us. Please remember that these powerful people look like us, and you should support the powerful people that look like you. And you are supporting the powerful people that look like you by coming in here and making sure they see that you love them just as much as they love you. So with that being said, thank you for being here today.